2020. And uh, we're really happy to welcome back one of our own, uh, Sanjay Dharmavaram. He, uh, he uh, graduated, uh, what, about five years ago? Mm -hmm. From uh, theoretical and applied mechanics. And if you want to know what that is, we can go have a beer together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, bachelor's degree at IIT? Yeah. And then uh, after leaving here, he spent about uh, three years at UCLA. Yeah. And he's been at Bucknell in the math department now for a couple of years. Anyway, welcome. Okay, okay. thanks so much Tim, for the introduction. And thanks for Center for Applied Math. There are a couple of putting all, you know, coordinating the posting, etc. And thanks for you to you all for coming in such large numbers. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about this model and some computational challenges with this model and how I address that on protein membrane interactions. And I hope uh, oh, when, I, when I said membrane, I hope it's clear that I was talking about the cell membrane. So since a lot of what I'm going to talk about is about modeling these membranes and proteins on them, um, I wanted to just maybe talk a little bit about the structure and you know some very characteristic features of it so that it will motivate the model. Um, so cell membranes you know, cover the cell. They provide some kind of a reaction vessel where all these complex biochemical reactions that are important for life happens within it. Not only the cell, but all its organelles. Uh, and the nucleus, of course, everything is enclosed by these membranes. And these membranes are semi-permeable in the sense that they only allow certain ions to get in. And that's actually important so that it maintains a certain pH and all these you know, uh, chemical gradients across the membrane. That is important for the proteins which are actually sitting on the membrane to do their function. So the proteins are actually are coordinating or orchest orchestrating these reactions. There are enzymes that help you know, make these reactions happen. Uh, these, uh, the membrane, the lipid, the cell membrane is made up of these molecules called lipids. They have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head, and when you put them in some kind of an aqueous solu solution, they form these bilayer structures, and as you can see, they're kind of jiggling around, and in, in two dimensions, they're free to flow around on the surface of the membrane, and so that gives rise to this very fluid-like behavior. And as Tim once, we were working on a project on membranes together, very graphically described it. Think of it as the swirls in a soap bubble. Molecules are moving around, so it's acting like a fluid. But it's different from a soap bubble in one sense. The, uh, the difference is that these, when you try to bend these, uh, this bilayer structure, the tails, which are hydrophobic, get exposed, and they don't like that. So it's like a soap bubble, except that they, are, they don't like to be bent. They have some kind of a bending stiffness, which makes them somewhere in between a fluid, like a soap bubble or soap, soap film, and a solid, which causes some numerical problems. Uh, but that's basically the, at least the, the, the modeling aspect that we need to take into consideration. Now, what I'm interested in is to understand how proteins and membranes interact. And, this happens a lot within the cell. There are these uh, protein-mediated endo and exocytosis. There are these clathrin proteins which help form these vesicles that enclo enclose any some kind of a cargo and that transport out of the membrane between different organelles along microtubules. And there the proteins and the membranes will have to interact and there should be some deformation of the membrane and the protein and the protein helps it and, is getting, and gets influenced by it and uh, you know, is important for this process. Another example where such a thing happens is in these enveloped viruses, as they're called, the HIV virus, where you have proteins, you can see the dark colored uh, interior, and then you have the <coughs> membrane of the infected cell, and this, this uh, HIV virus is uh, exiting the cell. Uh, this is the so-called immature stage where the proteins are still embedded on the surface of the membrane. And you can see there are lots of these holes in the membrane, and it's not very clear what function this holes play in the function in, in this life cycle of this HIV uh, shell. And there's another example here which is on these viruses called ATV, RKL viruses. Uh, they live in extreme environments like the hydrothermal vents. And it's actually very interesting because 
unlike most viruses, which are typically um, a cylindrical or spherical icosahedral shape, they have a lemon shape. I hope it's clear, uh, they kind of a lemon shape here. And when the temperature goes beyond the 75 degrees Celsius, they grow, start growing these tails, uh, and they have these hooks at the end of the tails, and it's an active process. Some kind of ATP is being used in this process to grow these long tails. There's some kind of a microtubule inside pushing the uh, ends out, and these tails hook onto a host. It's typically some kind of a archaea. It's a kind of version of a bacteria. Um, and so one of the questions here is, how is such a large scale uh, Deformation being sustained on this membrane, on this on this uh, uh, surface of this virus, um, and so the, again, there is protein and membrane being interacted, inter interacting, and we want to understand what is the mechanics of this process. So this interaction between membranes and some kind of particles, be it proteins or collides, actually is even has ha happens in collides. Uh, these collides on curved substrates. So. This has been actually uh, a lot of interest in the recent uh, uh, few decades because you can synthesize these colloids and put them on curved substrates and people are very curious to understand what, can, what is the role of geometrical frustration, for example, in the arrangement of these colloids. Uh, these experiments on the top are actually on fixed substrates and, oh, sorry, on a, on a fixed substrate, so the substrate is not responding to the organization of these colloids. Uh, but in applications for uh, litho lithography, soft lithography, there is a lot of interest in understanding how these colloids assemble on fluid substrates. So my hope is that the model and more uh, specifically the computational scheme that I'm suggesting here will help us understand or will help us model these and understand what's going on in these systems. So the motivation is done. So this will be my outline for the talk. So I will, I will first summarize what are the possible approaches people take to model this kind of protein membrane interaction. And I will present the model that I think is a, a good way to think about these problems, which is this hybrid model. So, uh, and I'll get to it. But there are some challenges. So although it's advantages in many ways, there is one annoying feature of it, which makes computations. And I do nonlinear PDEs, I'm Professor Healy's students. So, uh, so I, these nonlinear PDEs, I have to use computational methods, and they are uh, this feature of the hybrid model makes it particularly difficult in this lipid membrane problem. So I'm going to fix that with my so-called Lagrangian framework, and then I will do some numerics. So I'll do this Galerokin discretization is how I solve my PDEs. I'll show some results, and I'll point out some actually very interesting things we observe and its connection to some classical problems actually coming out of uh, electrostatics. Uh, and then I will present, this is still a work in progress, and I will try to see, uh, tell you where I'm going from here. So one, at one extreme is this completely discrete model. So molecular dynamics is a very you know, prominent version of this, where you model every lipid molecule, you mo model every protein molecule, uh, there are interactions, they have exert forces, and you can model them. Um, and you are basically applying Newton's laws and solve this whole system. As you can imagine, it's going to be really expensive. Uh, and you can only solve systems of a particular, you know, small enough size. And again, you need a lot of resources. You need some uh, fast computing, high, high performance computing uh, set up resources. But the advantage is that you can make the interactions very specific. If you want to model a very specific kind of a lipid and a specific kind of a protein, you can you know, achieve that using this kind of a model. A slight variation of this is this oriented particle model. So in this case, we have particles. You can say represent our proteins. And these have a, a director associated with them. So these two particles interact with each other but they also want their directors to have a particular configuration. So they exert forces in a way that align them in a specific way. And that is actually, people use this to understand viral capsid, which does not have a membrane, so it's just proteins forming a, some kind of a capsule which is holding the genome. Um, but one could argue that actually there is, if you think of it as a membrane, 
which resists bending along with these particles. There is, in some sense, an effective membrane which arises because of this interactions. You know, they want to align themselves so they don't want to bend. And so that effectively gives rise to some kind of a bending stiffness. But again, with, the, with, these pro, uh, with this uh, method, you have so many different parameters that you have to tweak so that you, know, you maintain the, uh, uh, the, what you want to achieve, the main, to maintain the interactions in a way that you want. Do you have so a question? Yeah, what are the independent parameters? So there are a ton. So there is one, you want them to be in a particular orientation. Then there is one, you, can, you want them to have a particular angle between them. Uh, I can't remember the other ones. Are you implicitly, when you say that, like setting what the membrane shape is going to be? By, by yeah, so for, for example, if there is an intrinsic curvature, then you want this to have a particular angle. If there is no intrinsic curvature, then they want to just be parallel to each other, for instance. Uh, the other extreme here is a purely continuum approach. So this actually, if you're familiar, this is the swift hohenberg uh, model. In physics, it's sometimes also called the lambda brezovsky model. So here, phi represents some kind of a density modulation, or if it's coming out of the space field approach, it's some um, phase field. And the way you interpret the phase field is you say the peak of it represents where the particle is. And there is a justification for this coming out of statistical mechanics, which says that this phi is actually a measure of the density modulation. So particles are there in some kind of a thermal equilibrium oscillating. So they're all, you know, somehow in some kind of a liquid state. And as you try to cool them, these particles don't want to move as much. And so the density will start to peak in very, very specific locations. And so that gives rise to these density fluctuation order parameters, as they call it. Um, but, and so that's called the lambda brezovsky model. Uh, and it, it ends up being some kind of a partial differential equation. Uh, and this K0 parameter that enters I mean, there are the other parameters, R, U, and W, but K0 is really the most important one because it sets the length scale in this particular uh, model. Uh, and this model is elegant, I would say, because it's a nonlinear PDE, it's a fourth order nonlinear PDE, uh, but there are problems. The problem is that it's hard to control the interactions. When you, do the, when you solve this on a flat surface, all you get is a hexagonal pattern. But if you want to model more complex interactions between these particles, the model does not allow that that easily. Uh, you'll have to come up, you have to cook up a completely different uh, partial differential equation. Uh, so, so far, this, I, I saw this just on a rigid surface, but you could combine this with models for membranes, and so you have one uh, unknown, which is our phase field, and there's another unknown, which is the shape of the membrane, for instance. And so you could do this kind of uh, membrane particle interactions in a completely um, continuum setup. Uh, one caveat with these models are they're physically justified only in the vicinity of a phase transition, as in if you're starting from a liquid state where this whole surface will be covered with just a constant, which means there is no density fluctuations, and when you're trying to cool it, when slowly these particles want to crystallize in a particular at specific locations and form a lattice. Um, so there are drawbacks, though, is it's only true in that uh, region, uh, or at least physically justified in that region. Are R, U, and W parameters? They are parameters. Actually, the, the important, other than K0, the R is the parameter that's of relevance. So if R is greater than zero, it turns out that the only stable solution is everywhere zero. But if you decrease, when R becomes negative, that's when you get new bifurcation uh, points, and one of these states becomes well, gains stability. And what's, do, you, do you know where the uh, biharmonic comes from? I mean, why is it the, so, the square of that operator? Uh, <clears throat> from, so it, in, the, from the, in the physics community, or so for, in the physics community, what they say, uh, this is the justification, is that when you do crystallization in liquid, liquid to solid, there is something called a structure factor, which measures if I'm a particle here and I draw a neighborhood, what is the probability of finding a particle over there? And if you're in an organized crystal, 
you would imagine, you know, that there'll be a peak right next because there's particles with high probability around you. And so this structure factor will have a peak at this wave number K0, and there's this whole machinery and statistical mechanics which says, if I have a structure factor of that form, then I can cook up an energy based on that. So that's, the, that's how they, it's a, yeah, it's a very different way of thinking, uh, at least coming out of continuum mechanics, but it was at least really interesting to see that the structure factor helps them cook these energy functions up. But U and W have to be non-zero, right? Uh, yes, U and zero, W are not non-zero, but, uh, sorry, uh, the, 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 the sign of U determines whether you want to see the peak this way or whether you want to see it down that way. Uh, but W mainly con controls the stability of the, of the, of the state, U and, uh, U and W in general. It does not, in some sense, uh, the features is not really controlled by W. Anyway. The nonlinear terms typically affects that stability. And what I'm proposing is this, you know, like a middle path where we have the continuum because people have studied lipid membranes and their models that are well, you know, like well studied and well used, been validated uh, for the cell membrane. Uh, but we, I do want to treat the part, the proteins as point particles uh, because that lets me give control over the kind of interactions I can put on the protein. And I can also <coughs> understand how this particle and the membrane you know, what kind of in, uh, interplay is going on between the particle and the membrane. But the, the continuum model you showed us a minute ago, that's for the particles. That's a continuum it, model. It's for, it's for the particles. The thing is, you can see over here, sometimes you just see it's in this like fuzzy state where all it means is that the it's, it's in some, the way it is interpreted is in some kind of a fluid phase. So that means the particles are there, but are just oscillating around so that the, the behavior has been fuzzed up, which would be the interpretation. Is that your simulation? Yeah. How do you do it? So I use this loop shells of this finite element scheme, and I use this uh, so there's an energy. But how did you find that pattern? Oh, I, will, I just use a brute force minimization solver. Okay. And I will talk. That's what I'm going to do, and I want to do something better in the future. Um, oh, sorry. I think I'm pressing the wrong key here. Uh, so, but the promise is that it's not expensive, and you get PDEs more or less, except that these particles, as you will see, will exert concentrated loads. Uh, but you can do custom interactions. Although I do, in my simulations for today, I just use point particles, right? You could imagine if a, if a particle, if a protein wants to have a particular cur intrinsic curvature, it's a conical shaped protein then you might want to do something better by putting you know, the particle type interactions that we saw before, but we're not modeling the membrane does what it, it, it does and it has been a validated Now this is the caveat here with this, with this method, which is a challenge I'm trying to address, is that um, these uh, particles have to be constrained to lie on the surface, right? Because they, are, they have to be embedded on the surface, they're embedded proteins but we don't know the surface, right? We are trying to find what shape will the surface take if these particles are interacting. So the shape of the particle and the surface are intrinsically coupled, but how do you enforce it? You could put constraints saying, I want this to lie on the surface, and I'm going to you know, successively solve, but it's very inelegant. So what I'm trying to address here is this elegant way where in just one fell swoop you can model that you can solve for the shape and the location of the particles. And it's actually based on a very simple idea, which I hope I'll get to soon. So I know that a lot of diverse, it's a pretty diverse audience. I don't know if everyone has continuum mechanics. So let me start with my really crude caricature of continuum mechanics, pardon me. Uh, so, so first of all, elasticity, right? So you all probably have seen this. If you're teaching differential equations, you've seen spring mass or systems. And uh, so let's say delta u is the uh, displacement, then you would just by balance, if we're applying Newton's law, you say that at equilibrium, that means we you know we're not trying to study any dynamics. At equilibrium, that would be the relation that should be held. Now you can look at it from a different perspective, which is to say that the spring has some internal, internal energy that's modeled through this Hooke's law, 
Uh, and then you can say that this free energy pi has to be minimized at that point, and they both end up being equivalent. Um, so, and this is the approach that continuum mechanics takes, where instead of actually applying Newton's law, you start with, typically, again, it's a very gross oversimplification, but you start with some kind of an energy that you want to minimize. Uh, now, moving on to 2D, right? So, instead of one spring, you can have all these different uh, masses connected by springs. You just zoom out, because they are tiny, you zoom out or you put a lot of them together. And in the limit, you get what is called a continuum. So if x is the location of this particle, and delta x, let's say, is uh, the, how much this particle moves, then as we saw before, the delta x will enter the energy, right? how much uh, ener elastic energy is being stored. Now the analog here is that, let's say this is my original state. And um, in mechanics, in continuum mechanics, we call that reference configuration, so that's where it's natural state. Uh, and let's say x is some point you're looking at, that's the analog of this xi. And let's say we deform it because of some force. So that particle x, which was here, has moved to this point, and f is keeping track of how different points move. And so the analog of delta x would be the gradient of f, right? Gradient is delta f divided by delta x in some crude sense. So I'm just trying to convince you that this is a quantity that is useful when we're talking about energies in the continuum set. Uh, now, as I told you before, the starting point is to postulate some kind of a ener elastic energy density for the medium. This was the analog of Hooke's law that we did. Uh, and W external is just all the external work done. Uh, maybe there are forces happening from the boundary that you have to include as well. And F is called is the deformation map. And gradient of F is the deformation gradient tensor. Okay, so that's the analog. That keeps track of the strain in some uh, crude sense. I know this is not the right exact way because you can do much more uh, precise things. Instead of putting F, you can put another tensor, like a strain tensor, which is more appropriate. But for us, all I care is to convince you that this, potent, this uh, free energy depends on F, on, on underlying mapping. And as before, you just minimize this with respect to any, you might have to add some boundary conditions, uh, and then you get an equilibrium state again. It's analog of solving Newton's uh, law for you know, second law. Now, of course, we are modeling shells. So for in our shells, it's no longer, it's not just a flat, right? It's, not the, it's going it's bending in the third dimension. So what people typically do, this is the so-called Coserot uh, framework, is you say at every point, I also have some vector n, which is keeping, maybe keeping track of how this thing bends. And you can say when it bends, of course, this point has moved to some other point, f of x, but the normal has changed. It has become lowercase n. This normal, by the way, does not have to be the normal, as I'm saying. You can use directors, and you can decouple its life, the, the life of the normal from the director. And this director maybe is keeping track of other things, so they're more fa fancy shell models. Uh, so in that case, n and f would be two independent things that you want to simultaneously solve for. Uh, but this energy density here will depend on that deformation gradient, which is the gradient of the map, deformation map and and gradient of n in general. You can add more complex things to this. But for us, actually it turns out the model that I'm going to present next, which is a very time and tested model if you want to say, uh, n actually is the normal. So if, it's, if n is the normal, then it's not an unknown. Right? If I tell you the shape, you can tell me what the normal is. So n and f should not be connected. Or if, if I tell f, you should be able to tell what n is. So it's not an unknown in this problem. So when you see my energy is next, it will only depend on one variable at this point. Next one, the next slide. So this is the so-called Helfrich model, uh, which models uh, lipid membranes. So the energy density here depends on capital H, which is called the mean curvature. So if you take a small patch of a surface, and you draw, you know, like the maximum radius and the minimum, 
you draw circles of maximum radii and minimum radii at that point, then the average of the reciprocal is called the mean curvature, and this product is called the Gaussian curvature. Uh, and you can imagine, right, the Gaussian curvature and the mean curvature, the curvature in general, should not depend on how I describe the surface, which coordinate system I use. Curvature is curvature. It doesn't depend on which coordinates I use. That, in some sense, is related to the fact that the uh, lipid membrane is a fluid, right? In a fluid, it, there are uh, the, this, this fact that the membranes don't depend on any reference configuration, any, any coordinate system to describe it, is how fluidity gets built in. So this is precisely cooked up so that you can get fluidity in the, in the, in the model. But because H appears, bending appears, curvature appears, bending appears in this situation. So it's a solid in some sense because there is some energy contribution to bending which is reflected in the curvature and it's uh, fluid in the two dimensions because it does not depend on what coordinate system we use. Of course there are all these parameters kappa and kappa g, uh, these bending moduli, people typically estimate this from experiments. Um, Another constraint that typically is employed here is this area constraint. So these lipid molecules, if you try to stretch them, if you try to stretch a lipid membrane, these molecules will separate. And again, the lipid molecules don't like that because their tails will get exposed to the aqueous environment. So it tries to hold on to the area. And I mean, one could say, you know, that's just an approximation. But this is commonly used in literature. Uh, and so I'm going to use that as well. Uh, this is an important point here, that omega that you see here, unlike here, the omega was the reference configuration, whereas here this omega is in the current configuration of the membrane. That's again a matter of fluidity. Solids don't, sorry, fluids don't have any reference configuration, so it doesn't really have to, you know, pay homage to that, right? Uh, and yeah, so that's just to remind you that it's a fluid. These molecules can move around, which is why you get omega and mean and Gaussian curvature actually. P, P was pressure and V. Yes, thank you. Yeah, sorry. P is the pressure and V is the volume enclosed. Now to model proteins, I'm using the simplest model, the Leonard-Jones interactions, uh, which models Van der Waals interactions. Uh, so you can see the, the energy for this looks like this, just one well. It exponentially, it grows, not exponentially, it uh, grows rapidly to infinity when R is zero and ex it decays uh, when R goes to infinity. The minimum is at R sub E. So you can imagine what happens. If I put two particles and they're trying to minimize their energy because that's the scheme that we're using here, or that's the principle of nature rather. So they both will try to maintain a distance of R. So that models the fact that molecule, you know, when mo molecules try to crystallize, they want to have a specific distance between them. If you put more molecule, if you put more particles, then uh, the interactions, be, can, the distance need not be R, R, E, right? Because this particle, if you put actually more than three particles, you can have the next two nearest neighbors. I have the nearest neighbors, and then it's also interacting with something beyond it, so they're both pulling each other, and so the distance could be smaller than R. Uh, but typically what you observe with these Leonard-Jones interactions is they all form some kind of a lattice structure when you uh, solve, when you kind of minimize the energy. So I'm combining these two models, right? So I'm saying here I have this energy. By the way, I have dropped the kappa G and K, the Gaussian curvature, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, and this U, which is just the sum total of all the particle interactions between uh, well, the n number of particles, of course, and the P. Uh, the Gaussian curvature and the, the Gaussian curvature does not enter the game because it turns out that if you're solving on a closed surface, a surface with no boundaries, I'm using it just to begin with because boundary conditions, applying boundary conditions and these kind of finite elements is a little tricky. So let's just start with no boundaries. Um, and in that case, it turns out by this gauss bonnet theorem that this integral of kappa will be a topological invariant. Unless your topology somehow miraculously changes, it's not going to enter the game. 
so as how you keep those particles on the surface? Yes, I think so. And that, okay, you kind of, uh, that is the challenge I was trying to point out is, how do these particles remain, or how can I enforce in my numerics, in my computations, how the particles should remain on the surface when I don't know where the surface is? Because ultimately the surface comes out of this minimization process. Again, I've just uh, symbolically represented F, which describes the shape of my surface, is an unknown, and where these particles are located is an unknown. And you could put constraints, there are ways to put constraints to do this, but they're ugly, they're very complicated to enforce uh, and computationally challenging. So that's my basic, what I'm, I'm trying to convince you is this new method which will actually keep track, of, be able to do this without having to put these constraints. And it's actually a very simple idea. It actually just comes out of con first class and continuum mechanics. Uh, for, which is this Lagrangian framework. You might have heard Lagrangian and Eulerian framework, right? So what I'm going to do is instead of putting x, which is where the particles are located now, I'm going to keep track of some capital X. What is capital X? It's fictitious. It has no physical meaning because these proteins can freely float around. So there is nothing really to say, oh, there is some preferred capital X where these particles are coming from. But it's my mathematical trick. I'll say that I'm going to solve for this capital X. And where, how do I know where the particle is? I'll just take this x and map it uh, using my f that I'm solving for. So I'm trying to, so, so in this new scheme, I'm solving for f and this fictitious location of the particles. And so once I solve for where these are and once I solve for f, I know, I know where my particles are located. They're located at f of x1, f of x2, and so on. That's like a constraint, though. Pardon me? That's like putting a constraint. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not putting it, so I'm not putting a constraint because I'm letting this x1, x2s to be whatever it wants so that this energy is minimized, right? Because I'm not saying that uh, I'm going to solve this equation, I'm, I'm going to minimize this equation with the constraint that f of the, the particles are located at this point. Do you see what I mean? The, the f's then are representing the mapping associated with how you transfer from the reference configuration over to the deformed configuration. F or X, sorry, I couldn't hear. Like the F, F? Uh, yeah. yeah, old F is, is telling you that all the particles that are in the reference configuration map to the deformed, and then those are the variables that you're putting in. Exactly. Your right. Yeah, so F is the mapping that, so I'm looking to find the mapping. I want to see if I have the surface put particles, how does it bend the shape, right? So F is saying the new shape of the surface. And capital X is these fictitious positions that I will let this energy minimize and determine where that x should be. And so then I'm, so I hope that's clear that I'm not putting any constraints, explicit constraints. No, it's just Yeah. Other than the constraint of constant area that I am putting, uh, because that's the requirement of this Hellfish model, at least in certain uh, literature. Okay, so this will be a technical slide, but I just want to illustrate one point here. So. Uh, you know, the usual game in this area is you, you postulate an energy, the elastic is this free energy, and then you do this calculus of variation. You minimize it because now you're looking for these f's, which is a function. So instead of just taking a derivative, calculus of variations helps you take derivatives when you have functions involved. Right? So I need to put variations in mind. You know, this is the equivalent of doing you know, the derivative, I'm perturbing my delta x. So this delta f is my perturbation in the function, my deformation. And I'm perturbing it in the normal direction. So the normal component, if you want, is eta. And v is the tangential component. So I'm taking the surface and perturbing it. So I'm saying, is this particular state a minimum? How do I check that? I'll take the surface, move it in the normal direction and then the tangential direction. And I will also take this x, which was in the reference configuration, and move it a little bit and see if the change in energy is zero. Then I would say I have a critical point. It's not a minimum, but it's a critical point. Um, so this is the interesting bit, is because this, in the, when you're taking this perturbation of this f, which is the current location of the particle, lowercase f, it has two contributions. One here because f is changing, because the surface is changing, and one because I'm also letting my 
x my uh, reference configuration of particle culture. And so you have two contributions. When I say this, I mean I'm evaluating this function, which depends on x, and x is equal to x. I have the location of the particle in the reference configuration. When you crank it out, it's a tedious calculation. People have done this lots a lot of times before, at least this part, is the PDEs that comes out of trying to extremize the Helfrich energy. Now, the other contribution due to the particles enters here. So, GI is the derivative of the energy with respect to the location. So, the derivative of energy with respect to the location is just a force, right? So, if you take, so these are forces, forces, that's the membrane experiences, but you only get a normal contribution, right? I'm taking the dot product of the normal, which makes sense. If there is a tangential contribution, this proteins would have moved and would have tried to find a new equilibrium, right? So, you only get the normal contribution, um, Dirac delta, because it's a concentrated load because of the particle, and this F transpose G is the pullback, because if you're doing everything in the reference configuration, these interaction forces that these particles are ex experiencing in their current environment have to be pulled back uh, to their reference configuration. So we want to solve this PD. So your, your inner particle interactions are a function of distance, so is that, yes. that's, is that a distance along the surface? Or oh, is good question. I'm of... using three-dimensional uh, distance, the Euclidean distance. Uh, and you could justify, that's actually the more reasonable thing to do because protein interactions are electrostatic, which would not happen along the surface, but it's three-dimensional. Yeah. So capital M is also a parameter, how do you choose that? Uh, capital, so the, which one? the number of particles per area. Oh, yeah, that I choose a priori. So I just say I'm interested in what happens when I put these many particles. Is there some range that is more interesting than other ranges? Okay, so you'll see my my solutions so far have been uh, in very small end cases. I'll show you a simulation where it's large, but there are some problems which I will address numerically, and it's to do with the Leonard Jones interactions. So to solve this problem or to minimize it, I mean technically I'm solving this PDE, but the way we're doing it is using this Geller kit. If you're done finite elements, you probably know how this works. Uh, you and, and before I get to the discretization step, I'm going to make one answer, which is that I'm only I'm saying that my surface that I'm looking for, this might be misleadingly look like a axisymmetric surface, but it's not. It's just a regular three-dimensional surface. Uh, but the point I was trying to make with this figure is that F, I'm saying, is measuring how much it radially displaces from this reference spherical state. There is good reason to do that. You can say, hey, in general, this particle over here could move there. So they could have a normal contribution and a tangential. But because it's a fluid, there is really no tangential contribution. Because I could say in the reference configuration, I can simply move the particle there. It's a fluid. I can just rearrange where my original molecules were. And so this is good enough to describe such particles. You do end up into trouble if you have you know, uh, more pinched shapes like this, where you will have, you know, you will have a unique way to represent any point on the surface. But you're doing this because it's computationally the, doing the three-dimensional uh, cases way more complicated. But it could be done. I'm trying to here illustrate how this Lagrangian framework works, um, rather than get, you know, shapes that are high, highly pinched, to which maybe at this point I'm not really curious about. But if you didn't do this, you'd have big problems if you were just trying to minimize energy. Yes, you would have your uh, Hessian will always be singular because you get these uh, modes that are fluid modes. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I'll use my radial displacement. Theta and phi are my polar coordinates, is what I decided to choose. You can choose any coordinate system you want, but I chose polar coordinates, which will be clear in a second. The location of the particles is being kept track of on this reference surface, which is a sphere. And to solve it, I've taken uh, this approach of just taking my W and expanding it in spherical harmonics. It's spectral, because I'm using the Fourier series equivalent for sphere. I'm using spherical harmonics. So right now, F is being F has become W. W has become CLM. That's what I'm actually solving for. So I'm trying to minimize this new free discretized free energy. 
that depends on the spherical harmonic coefficient and the location of the fictitious location in the reference configuration. And yes, so now I'll confess, I'm just using a brute force minimization solver. So uh, LBFGS is a very popular brute force minimization. It's a quasi-Newton gradient descent uh, algorithm. Uh, and that's what I'm using right now. So, and these are my yes, questions. Are you going to tell us what capital U is? Capital U? Yeah, your stored energy, your discrete stored energy. U is a function of F1, F2. Yeah, can you show this? The interaction of the Leonard Jones. Oh, the Leonard, oh, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. So it's over here, this one. It's all the Leonard Jones interactions. So I'm saying every particle is interacting with every other particle. So it could leave the surface, it just would have hell to pay if it did. Say that again? It could, yeah, exactly. But, but to enforce that, you'll have to either put a constraint to say that, you know, if you want to leave the surface, you have to hell to pay, or this other approach, which you don't need to put that constraint. Also, because if you put constraint, you'll have to put some other parameters to make that you know, happen, and so you're tweaking them. So you're minimizing over the space of x and f, right? Yes. So you're going to have. Right, go ahead. Uh, your um, the function you're minimizing will likely be pretty nonlinear because you can switch two x positions and You'll, get another minimum, right? It's, it's highly nonlinear. Okay. You'll see from the results that you will get multiple equals. So, how do we know that we're getting necessarily? That's my question for you guys. I don't know the answer to that. <coughs> Optimize. What's the end of your question? How do you know you're getting, a, like, the minimum you're getting is a physical minimum? Physical. As in the minimum and not a critical. Oh, you know, you get or, the, yeah. The, the absolute minimum. Yeah. Well, that's, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. You're definitely getting metastable equilibrium. If you do that, and right? LBFGS for sure is producing a lot of metastable. And I, till now, I don't know. Just rigorous optimization of a really hot, non, you know, hot, hideous energy landscape. But I don't think there's any answer to that. So, uh, there are people do use Monte Carlo simulations and this and that. I don't know, yeah, and I'll talk about it in the, uh, some of it in a second. Um, for three particles, what I've done here is I've set the bending stiffness to be some value, and I've changed the equilibrium distance. If I make the equilibrium distance small, what do you think will be the minimum energy of a configuration? If I put three particles. Uh, if I put R E small, very quite small, it'll be a sphere with three particles just right there at the equilibrium distance, right? Because it, do, it does not want to spend any bending energy, and it's quite happy to be at the equilibrium distance. So uh, just so that I can see this interaction between the surface and where these proteins are, I've chosen the equilibrium distance to be large enough so that they induce some. Oh, preempted a few slides there, uh, just to see the interactions in between the bending. So if you put three, I don't think it's a surprise that you'll see a triangle would be most likely an equilibrium configuration. Yes? If you slowly change that uh, equilibrium distance, does this shape compress up to a certain point and then bifurcate and they become non-symmetric? So uh, you mean increase or decrease? Or decrease. Or with, oh. Whichever one would cause it to. Oh, right. so what I see is uh, you, do, you get, so right now it's a triangle, and if I start to decrease, then it becomes less and less pronounced triangular, and then you get a completely spherical state, and then after that, these particles will start moving towards each other, and then we'll. So I don't see any bifurcation per se, or it's maybe a. Yeah, I don't know. Like if you these want to be closer to each other, does it compress? So the compression will be a metast is a un you know, it's a maybe a locally stable or unstable equilibrium. I don't know for sure. When I, because I'm doing brute force minimization, I just start with some random condition, say search. I never got anything that has dimples in it. Is that, is that what you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's because I think. That's the problem with the fishing expedition. Yeah, I'm going on a fishing. I like to use that. <laughs> I always remember that you say you use, and I use that sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, four, you get a tetrahedron. What about five? Any any ideas or any suggestions? With five particles, we get two possibilities, depending on, of course, the bending stiffness. 
One is this pyramidal shape, right? So the one is at the North Pole, and then you have four corners. Uh, and so it's a square. So this has a D4V symmetry. So it's a dihedral four-fold symmetry because it has the D represents you have reflections. And V represents there's a vertical mirror plane. So I hope that helps you visualize what's going on here. Um, the other the configuration that's possible, this happens for a different uh, kappa value is you get this triangular bipyramid. So you have a triangular, I hope the figure of it explains well here. The different symmetry. So I'm pretty sure, if not a bifurcation, you know, there are multiple paths, and at some point, even if they don't intersect to have a bifurcation, the stability is switching. Is this at zero pressure or something? Uh, so I, I should know this. I think I might have set zero pressure in this case. Uh, but I tried, I mean, if you put, negative pressure, then of course the surface will buckle, right? And so, but I'm not interested. I want to understand how the particles and the membranes interact. So I think about, I've tried putting positive pressure, that is from inflating it from the inside, no different, other than this being less pronounced. And you can actually, this also the results make sense. If kappa is large, it's a high bending stiffness, so it does not want to bend as much, so the structure you get is more spherical, whereas you have a low bending stiffness, it's okay to have high curvatures, so this becomes more energetically favorable. Um, so these are the other options. I've tried until 12, I've tried more than that, but actually you see a very intricate and beautiful phase diagram if you want, right? If n is equal to six, you get an octahedral symmetry, that's a diamond shaped thing. n is equal to 12 here, you get an icosahedron. Uh, n is equal to 7, you get a 5-fold symmetry here, or a 3-fold symmetry. Uh, or again, you have these other configurations. There are lots of different symmetry possibilities, I find. At least in the parameter regions that I have sourced, I only found these two. But it's kind of interesting. And what one of the questions that I'm interested in is how does this coupling between elasticity and this, you know, the particle interactions, how does it influence the symmetry, you know, like basically understanding the phase diagram better in this case. Um, actually, there is a curious connection between the problem that I just solved and this very classic problem of so the so-called Thomson problem. So this is J.J. Thomson who discovered electrons. Uh, so he was in this plum pudding model, right, this was before the regular understanding of uh, an atom. He wanted to see how electrons would distribute on a rigid surface. Right, and so uh, the interactions is very basic, uh, uh, Coulombic interactions. So you try to minimize this total energy here, just the total co Coulombic interactions. And what we find is actually most of the configurations that I get are actually the ones that these get. But in this, it's categorical, as in you only you get one unique minimum. How do they get it? I think it's a so they do a lot of Monte Carlo, this, that, and. I think pe people believe what they find is true. Okay, so that's all I can say about the Thomson problem. That there is a unique minimum, they all have symmetries. They don't have any competition like the way we find. Uh, there is another related problem. This is the Thomas's problem. Uh, it's a packing problem. He was actually a botanist trying to understand how to put, how plants determine where to put the pores of the pollen grain. So for n equals five and more, you have more than one configuration. Yes. Uh, so if the Fossey new, uh, Newton converges to one minimum, yeah. how do you get the other one? No, so I'm choosing different uh, parameter values. Yes. Okay. For the same. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So there, there. Yeah. In in the electrostatic, there's no other parameter. That's the only possible. Uh, the Thomas's problem, yeah, he was trying to understand how to put these uh, caps on, and how pollen caps from which pollen would flow out, the pollen grain would flow out, uh, and how to pack them. So this question was how many spherical caps, because the plant, the assumption is, is trying to maximize how many caps it can put on a pollen grain of a given size and a given cap size. And so that question actually ends up being, it turns out you can rephrase it as how can you pack n identical circles on a sphere so that the minimum distance between the circles is maximized. 
has a similar flavor, let's say, of this question of you know packing on a surface. Of course, uh, the Tom Thomas's and the Thompson and the Thomas problems are on a rigid surface. There is no elasticity. Curiously, actually, only by the way, n less than 14 has been rigorously proven. This, by the way, actually, you people can prove mathematically because they morph it into some kind of a graph theoretic problem, and then you can use some techniques from that to prove. And only n less than 24 and n is less is equal to 20, less than 14 and 24 is known for sure. Many, again, you see a lot of similarities between Thompson problem and Thomas's problem, except curiously these numbers. Um, and for n is equal to 7, what we found was Thomas produced one of the configurations that we found, and Thompson picks the other one. Still, I have no answer to what is going on here, but I'm just trying to point out some interesting things that we have observed, and in some sense, the problem as an intermediary between Thomson and Thomas. But is it an intermediary in the uh, so in, in the Thomson pro, uh, Thompson problem, in the Thompson problem, the, the uh, energy is purely repulsive, right? But in the in the our model, there's uh, repulsive and and attractive components. So maybe something is going on. I still haven't figured out in the Thomas's problem, is it uh, attractive or repulsive? What is going on over there? But that is my hunch that you know there must be some connection between them and that we are seeing in this video. And this is just out of curiosity, just put a ton of particles and see what happens. Uh, and you can see, I mean, at least it looks reasonable. And what actually caught my attention, is, so I'm trying to increase the equilibrium distance here. I'm started with a small equilibrium distance, so all the particles are clustered on one side. I'm increasing the equilibrium distance and they are flowing out. But what I'm curious is these defects that are formed on the surface and how, you know, as you change parameters, they're kind of bifurcating into different, uh, what do you say? Not symmetries, but you know, different configurations. Um, but I am not sure, I'm gonna say with this caveat, if what I'm finding here is a local minimum or a global minimum. I, if I were to bet on it, I think it's all stuck in some kind of a local minimum. Why yeah. do you think? Uh, because we also see in other simulations that if you put two particles, okay, and we don't know categories. What was changing in these? So I was changing the, uh, if I can just put this, I'm changing the equilibrium distance, so the RE, so where these particles want to be preserved. So I cannot say for sure why it's, it's not a local minimum or global, is because I would imagine, one could argue, that if it were a situation like this, where all the particles, so the equilibrium distance is small enough, there should be no deformation in the surface because all the particles should be just you know close to the equilibrium distance and they should cover the surface, right? Why should there be any deformation? But there you can argue that in, in this model, right, I'm you one particle is interacting with every other particle. So even though the neighbor might be happy, the one who's farther away can pull this membrane down and could induce a deformation in the membrane. So that could be going on, but I don't know how to kind of disentangle all these things. But I have seen in my numerics that if I say, start with a particular configuration uh, uh, in, in the lower n, uh, n, the lower n values, and I know that there another configuration exists, but I start with a very symmetric case and I run my LBFGS, it just stays there. Even though I know that the other one has a lower energy. For a fixed number of particles, have you found this is local minimum? For a fixed number of, so. For the same, for the same parameters? Oh, no, I haven't, okay. Uh, because LBF just, yeah, I haven't got, so usually it picks one or the other. So I suspect one is more favorable than the other. Have you, have you thought about what your model is as n goes to infinity? No, I haven't. It's some kind of uh, strange it should be. phase field. Uh, right, like a Leonard Jones phase field. Yeah, so like a like a coarse grained version of the Leonard Jones. What yeah. would it look like? That's the one challenge with Leonard Jones, which is why I don't trust these like local. I suspect the local minimum is that the tail is very you know expert is is growing gradually, right? So you could have so many different configurations where a minor tweak would change the energy by just a gradual amount, 
and you could find tons of different, and actually this is true, if you, if you forget the membrane, if you just try to understand Leonard Jones cluster, I have particles, and it's, uh, uh, it would, it would be some non-local phase field monster. Oh, for the, okay. Yeah. Oh, with the phase field model, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I have but, 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 but higher gradient versions of that. Right, because it's, it's interacting next to the unit. I see, right, 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 right. Yeah. But with Leonard Jones, if you just take Leonard Jones, forget the membrane, you just put particles and see what kind of three-dimensional interaction, what kind of clusters they form. It's a very non-trivial problem, and people sure. have studied because and they find the number of equilibria, that local minima that are possible, just grows like crazy. And so they do all this like basin hopping, a little bit of a stochastic, you know, methods they use. And all I can say is that's the that's that's where the state of art is in terms of if you want to say some some Leonard Jones, there are all these databases for Leonard Jones clusters. And they all use these sort of methods, and that's all. You know, that's how they're presented. So this is, and it's people believe in some sense. Yeah, that is the answer. I don't know if it's true or not, but that is the state of the art. Um, yeah, and the full protein folding. So to summarize, right? So different approaches, and I focus on this a discrete continuum model, and then, you know, like advertising it as kind of best of both worlds. And I pointed out the challenge and this Lagrangian framework, which kind of very seamlessly tries to solve what's going on, and uh, I've, the results I've tried to connect them to some other interesting problems. Now, the future work, there's a lot to be done. Uh, so, one thing is, again, this is, uh, I don't know, I can't say it's true. One thing is for certain, and I cannot categorically say that, uh, but what people do, uh, oh, what people do see is that if you take these Leonard Jones, so this is on a rigid surface, uh, this is a simulation on a rigid surface, you take Leonard Jones particles, put it on a cylinder. Then it turns out that, and the, this is a Monte Carlo simulation, you do the Monte Carlo simulation, eventually you get a hexagonal packing. So what you're seeing here is not the particle, but this Voronoi tessellation as it's called. So I take the particle and see where its neighbors are and draw a hexagon around. Uh, so that is a minimum energy state, or that's what people believe is true. Uh, but if you start putting things on curved surfaces, although I showed you in the beginning, you get these nice symmetric configurations with you know like this symmetry and that symmetry. If you throw in a ton of particles, apparently there are these so-called scars. It's a thing that people in the physics community believe is true. If you throw in a lot of particles, you don't get symmetric structures. There are these scars. Um, experimental observations also predict this. And not Leonard Jones, but they use some excluded volume interactions, etc. Uh, but my question is now if you and allow this membrane to be elastic, so these particles are not on a rigid surface, but on a flexible surface, what happens to these scars? Do they heal in some sense? You know, like what is going to happen? Uh, on the computational side, you know, I've used the spectral methods. It is useful, but sometimes it's very time consuming. I use a ton of quadrature points because these are non-local uh, shape functions. So we do want to, when collaborated, I want to uh, extend you know, this uh, to the, some kind of a shell model, like a shell finite element approach. Uh, and this, you know, Monte Carlo, just because I don't know what else to do, but I, uh, you know, in terms of understanding this minimum energy concept. But uh, you know, so right now I have an undergraduate student working on understanding the symmetry states. You know, using how do you uh, explore the phase diagram for small number of particles. So with this, I'd like to th thank my collaborator Luigi Perotti, who's at University of Central Florida, Robin Brunsna, and Claire Chang, who's an uh, undergrad at Thanks for your attention. plus uh, plus and I have done I think about 500 particles uh, and the 500 and we were running for a long time uh, you know like lots of RE not one configuration but I'm trying to explore the series that took me maybe less than a week in the 
Uh, so it was like a my desktop. You know, I had a desktop, but similar computation, maybe slightly less computational power than this. So it's like a slightly older one. So, so in your deformation map, yeah. it seems like there's like a whole lot of symmetry that's available to you when you're going from like. So, you mean yeah or no no no? So so like 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 your your stiffness only depends on the curvature, right? Yes. So it seems like I could have a deformation that like packed all of my particles into like a certain side yeah. and still have like. The surface yeah. be the same size, so or like I could have a lot of shear yeah. in this map. Okay, is that a problem? So you can't have shear in this model, there's, because there's no energy cost for shear. So actually, by choosing this radial coordinate system, right, I've gotten rid of shear. It's like saying on a soap bubble, is, can you shear something and will it cost oh. any energy? Oh, I see. So, so the it, only displacement is the it, radius. It's got an area constraint. Okay. And I have an area constraint. You the area constraint. Okay. So it can't blow up. Okay. I, I understand. Yeah. If you or anyone else looked at the planar case? Oh, so the planar case, uh, oh, with the, with the interactions? Like a, a ring. Let's say that a plane yeah. is formed and there's particles all around. Oh. No, I haven't. The thing is with planar uh, is, I mean, it's hard to motivate. I mean, you could sort of study it, but you know, like the fluid. So what, the thing that this is relying on is the fluidity of that membrane, right? In one dimension, you know, like what are we talking about? Right? How do you motivate that fluid? It just becomes an elastic rod. Yeah, it's a solid. It's no longer a fluid. So, well, fluid in the sense that the particles can move along the rod. Right. Uh, yeah, but the rod itself is not a, so one could say, how is this proteins, how can they move, how, the, how can these particles move, right? So, but in a one dimension, it's, you know, the, 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 when you write them, there's no real. But they can, they can move, but once you've found one, you have found all of them. So you may as well treat it like, like a rod. But rod isn't a solid they, object. They can't mix up anymore, you know, when it's actually symmetric. Whereas in the, in the 3D thing, you can stir. So we did you do validation. Yeah, we did validation studies on a on a on a solid. So this is what we did. So actually, what we did like just make sure that our finite elements is um, meaningful. We did this. So if I put two particles, then on a rod. I mean, okay, there's no bending, it's just purely uh, rod. So they just want to come and be at a particular distance. And there's not enough degrees of freedom there to see anything interesting. But he's advocating a ring. A ring, okay, yeah, that happens. Um, are there any useful asymptotic behaviors for your system if you take one of your parameters and you make it zero or go to infinity? Oh, so, right. Uh, yeah, like Professor Healy was suggesting, if you right. take n to infinity, you, maybe you get something. Right, okay, yeah, that so, when you take the bending stiffness to infinity, right. you get a rigid sphere, right. right? And so we did check. So the results we are getting was we solved on a rigid surface to see if at least if the thing is free enough. Right. So yeah, we did that. But I haven't taken the number of particles to infinity, for example. Okay. And in that limit, you would just be solving the, I forgot the name of it, but you'd just be solving that problem where you're packing Yes, oh, uh, not quite, uh, because that is for a different interaction potential. So this is for this interaction potential. I just well, put I my Leonard Jones interaction. One more thing, too, the, um, that fee model, the yes. continuum model yes. that showed us a long time ago. Yeah, the land of resources. So that must, be, that must be not only interacting this way, yeah, but but this way. So in, in the figure that I'm showing, there is no this interaction because I'm not. Yeah, but in this model, yeah, that's why the biharmonic is showing up. Oh, because it has to be. Oh, because of the curvature, you're saying. Yeah. But the thing is, though, actually, oh, the because the the uh, Laplacian only involves the metric tensor. Yeah. There is no curvature involved. It's completely, you know, in. I mean, I suppose Gaussian curvature. And no, but if, if you just had. Uh, Interaction like this, yeah. you get a second order operator there, and you're getting a fourth order. Oh, I see. There has to be something, some orientation, some interaction like that on, right? Yeah. Otherwise, that would be like almost like a standard phase field. 
Right, almost. But the phase field, yeah, will not pick up a very specific you know, wave number as a pre preferred config. It will just do configurations like, like that. The phase field. Oh, just, right. Your bloody thing. Right, but it's not stable. Oh, it, no. oh yeah. I don't, I don't, but at least the ones we solved in the axis symmetric is only no, one. No, it's not from your thesis, it's from Simi. It's in it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so here, I mean, the main reason you did the hybrid model was yeah. because you couldn't control particle interactions with that, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so in this in yeah. this case, is there any control. control of particle interactions, or is it just because the model is not good? I mean, it comes to, it relates to Tim's question, like, yeah. is there a continuum model? So okay, so uh, with this particular energy, there's an energy with this, but I'm this particular saying. model. Yeah. Other than K naught, so you do these things, you get. So K naught will just fix the, you know, the spacing between the peaks. Uh, and actually, if you set one of these parameters U to zero, I forget. I should go back. But one, of, I think it's for, I'm ninety percent sure it's U. Then you actually don't get like this hexagonal lattice, but you get stripes. Uh, so it's like a what in physics community they'll say it's a smectic model, something which has layers in it. Uh, but those are the only two things you can observe, at least in terms of equilibrium, as in you know, a minimum energy. So if you again do this brute force energy minimization, uh, those are the only two stable stuff you will find. Uh, you could find metastable or unstable states where maybe it's a uh, you know like. Not hexagonal packing, but like a square packing and things like that. But you cannot change uh, the interactions. You can't say that I only want it to have, let's say, six fold interactions. Because at some point you might observe, I can't, if you're not here, you'll get something with a five fold neighbor. So maybe not this one. So you'll have something like this. So you have one peak here and you have five peaks here. Uh, and then you have the other ones have six peaks, right? You can't say, oh, for whatever reason, my, only, my protein only has six-fold interactions because of the shape of it. You can't control those things. So if you fix the parameters like kappa and number of particles, yeah. do you start with an initial guess for where the particles, to begin with, yeah. where they start for the Newton solver? So what do I, or can you? Uh, I mean, when you start the minimization yeah. process, so do you give that as an initial care? I do this, I, but I randomize so, it. So in that case, if you keep changing the initial gear, do you yeah. expect to get a different solution? No. So what I showed you is after just doing random, and it always gives the same solution. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that uh, is your question, these shapes that I get, they're not based on one simulation. I've randomized the not only where the location of the particles, even the spherical harmonic modes. I'm saying start with any random spherical harmonic coefficients and minimums. So that's that, to be a one local Yeah, so. Is that rigorous? I don't know. But it's a deep one. Does that make sense? So does that indicate that there are no other byproducts of yeah, so. No, he never claimed that. He's just minimizing energy. Yeah, so I don't know if there are bifurcating solutions or not. But the same but yeah. numerically it's suggested that maybe there's one lower. One lower. Yeah. But the question, I mean, are they meta state? You know, it's still useful to understand meta stable uh, states, right? Which this minimiz minimization solver will not find. Actually, that basin hopping that the Leonard Jones, uh, they actually, in some sense, figure out what all the possible. They, Kind of zoom in on the possible meta stable and use that information to determine which is the meta. So I think it's still useful to understand, you know, this bifurcation diagrams to understand what are the other possible. You better states. say that. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now. Just trying to understand the the bifurcation structure. <laughs> so using how feasible would it be to start the e equals three case and then do continuation to change the equilibrium distance? Is that just oh, too computation hard? Or? So start with n is equal to three and change the equilibrium distance. No, so we do continuation. So I'm yeah, no, no, that's what I'm essentially doing. I'm not so using it. it. He changes it and then he minimizes yes. energy again. And I use the previous one as the starting point. I thought you were, I thought you were randomly 
guessing. Right. No, I've, I've done that too. But I mean, I've also tried just changing the the equilibrium distance. And but the thing is, if it's say for in this case, right? Uh, if I go from, I don't know where exactly that jump happened or the jumps connected in any way. That I don't know. I'm just randomly, you know, randomly. I'm just minimizing the energy. So yeah, I tried random initial conditions and. I've even explored what happens to see, you know, if there is a trying to explore the bifurcation diagram. But I, at some point when I do this, it switches. But I have no clue if it's a bifurcation in that sense. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you.